Tolstoy began his novel Anna Karenina by saying, All happy families are alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. And though I usually try to keep things positive on this channel, put some good vibes out into the world, sometimes it does feel like all happy movie reviews are alike. There was great cinematography. Uh, great acting. But in my view, this was a year that truly plumbed the depths of this genre in some of the most unique and, and farcical ways imaginable. So welcome back, everybody. I'm Jake, the Scary Story Guy, and today we are breaking down my 10 least favorite horror movies of 2023. I am going to do a top 10 list as well coming soon, so stay tuned. But to be honest, this is the list I really feel a lot of passion for, because to me, this was a horror year defined by disappointment. And I did make full-length videos for eight of the 10 films on this list, so if you'd like my more in-depth thoughts, they're available. But without further ado, let's get started. My 10th least favorite horror movie of the year is actually the one I may have been the most excited for, which is Renfield. Renfield stars Nicholas Holt as Renfield, the beleaguered manservant of Nicolas Cage's Dracula. And this movie had excellent marketing and excellent premise, but to me, this was the classic example of a movie where the trailer shows every good part. Because instead of a full movie based on that fun Renfield Dracula dynamic, instead of giving Nicolas Cage all the time and space he needs to cook, we spent just a, a frankly unconscionable amount of time with Aquafina as one of the most incompetent and, and pointless characters, police officers, to ever appear on a movie screen. It felt like buying tickets to an NBA game where all the stars are sitting out, right? You came for LeBron, and instead it's just D'Angelo Russell chucking up contested jump shots all night. Sticking with the Dracula theme, my ninth worst horror movie of the year was the Last Voyage of the Demeter. And this is a movie that I actually didn't make a video about because I came away with really almost nothing to say. The Last Voyage of the Demeter was based on a fragment of a chapter of Bram Stoker's classic horror novel, Dracula, which I think one of my bigger horror hot takes is that that's just an incredibly boring book. It birthed an iconic character, it's also a pretty tough read. And I think the people making this movie were inspired by the novel in that it just was pretty bleak and boring and flaccid. Dracula is a character that throughout time has bred some pretty interesting performances from Bela Lugosi to Christopher Lee to Gary Oldman to, to even Nicolas Cage, right? But here they basically turn Dracula into a, a creature that is completely devoid of personality, thus turning this movie about him loose on a ship into a work that's completely devoid of enjoyment. My eighth worst horror movie of the year, this is another one that I had high expectations for that did just leave me feeling pretty flat, The Pale Blue Eye. Now this is technically listed as a 2022 release because it came out in a few theaters at the very end of last year, but I like to go by the broad mainstream release, which this was released to everyone on Netflix at the very beginning of this year. The Pale Blue Eye stars Christian Bale as a detective who is investigating the death of a military cadet, and he enlists the help of another cadet at the Academy, Edgar Allan Poe. And both Bale's performance and the performance of Harry Melling as Edgar Allan Poe, he might know him as Dudley Dursley, were excellent, and I knew they would be, and that's why I was excited for the movie. Unfortunately, that is all there is to see here. This is an absolute slog to get through. I completely forgot this movie existed for the last 11 months. Like, I was looking back at my letterbox list for this year just to make this video, and I was like, Oh yeah, that's a movie that, that, that happened, which is not what you want. Number seven, this is going to be a controversial one because I think this is the most critically acclaimed of all the movies on this list, but I really did not like Thanksgiving. This is a holiday themed slasher brought to us by Eli Roth. And I went in thinking, okay, this has a lot of potential. At least it's getting some, some really solid reviews, but I just got to call them like I see them guys. Thanksgiving is basically the Scream franchise's warmed up leftovers. It's the familiar formula. We've got this big ensemble cast, a guy in a mask starts killing people and we're all just waiting for the Scooby-Doo reveal when the mask comes off and we find out who it is. But while the Scream franchise strikes a very winning and consistent tone and has a very memorable, unique cast of characters, Thanksgiving is trying to be scary and funny at the same time and ends up being neither. And it does so with the most forgettable cast of characters I've seen in recent memory. Coming in at number six on my list, another massive disappointment. To be honest, I'm shocked there are five movies that I liked less than this. We have Insidious the Red Door. I've actually reviewed every movie in this franchise. I used the first four as kind of my introduction into, into video making, and I thought the first one is, is very good. The second one is a worthy sequel. I did have some serious problems with the third and fourth installments, but I couldn't help feeling excited for this one because it marked a return back to the storyline of those first two movies. Patrick Wilson and Rose Byrne are back. Patrick even made his directorial debut here, and let me just say, the personnel is not the problem here. Everyone behind the camera and in front of the camera are very capable. The problem with Insidious the Red Door and it's, it's very clear. 
is that it has one of the most limp d scripts ever written. This was written by a guy named Scott Teams, who, you know, I don't, I don't want to overstate the case here, but Scott Teams is a terrorist for classic horror franchises. I'll leave it there for now, but Scott Teams is going to be coming up again later in this video. Number five on my list, yet another completely unnecessary sequel, The Nun 2. Now, I actually zagged a bit in my review of the first Nun movie. I did not hate it. It's not a quote-unquote good film, but it's at least a good time. But the second Nun is just not fun. The only two things I remember for certain are one, a reasonably cool scene that, of course, was spoiled by the trailer, and two, the the fact that you just can't see shit for the entire runtime of this movie. It's honestly crazy. This was directed by Michael Chavez, who they're, they're really not putting this guy in a position to succeed. I'll admit, it, they just keep giving him the worst movies in the Conjuring cinematic universe to try and make something out of. But it's like Zach Wilson on the Jets, where you know nobody could have turned this pile of dog shit into anything worth watching, but you've also seen enough to be pretty sure he just kind of sucks. Number four on my list is the Five Nights at Freddy's movie. Now, to be fair, I know this is not for me. This is a movie that is ostensibly for like 12 year olds, which is why it's so inexplicable that this movie is so dismally languid. Five Nights at Freddy's is based on a wildly popular horror video game about a Chuck E. Cheese-esque restaurant where some shenanigans go down with all the animatronic characters. And of course, the ideal when you have a movie that's targeted towards kids is that it's also kind of enjoyable for adults too, right? You just Shrek, The Emperor's New Groove, Pixar movies are really good at this. But what's just bewildering is when a movie for kids contains a bunch of stuff that neither adults nor kids would like. Five Nights at Freddy's is like one part creepy animatronics and five parts childhood trauma and custody battles and just Josh Hutcherson looking sad. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say the horror movie for children should not have been a character drama, but it especially should not have been a bad and boring one. Number three on my list, and folks, we are now armpit deep in this septic tank of a year, Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. The beloved Pooh Bear IP has entered the public domain, which means people can now officially make artistic abominations involving these characters without incurring the legal wrath of Disney. You better start talking, Pop! You better start talking right now! <laughs> and again, with the wasted potential this year, a, a slasher movie involving the Winnie the Pooh characters is something that actually in an alternate world could have been pretty fun. But sadly, we don't live in that world because Winnie the Pooh Blood and Honey can really only be said to be a Winnie the Pooh movie in the loosest sense imaginable. First of all, we only get Pooh Bear and Piglet, none of the other characters. And second of all, we don't get anything that actually makes these characters Pooh Bear and Piglet. They're just two giant rednecks dressed up in a pig mask and a, a bear mask. And, and combine that with just an atrocious script and, and bad acting and just poor filmmaking generally, this movie just fucking sucks. Number two is a film that in any other year would have been at the very end of this video. You'll find out why it's not shortly, but I swear to you that The Exorcist Believer is the worst sequel of a classic movie ever made, and that is a category with a lot of competition. Once again, this script was brought to us by Scott Teams, a man whose parents change the subject when their friends ask about him. And it's almost impossible to oversell how bad this movie truly is. The Exorcist Believer is, to the horror genre, what the guillotine was to French royalty. I don't know if we can actually recover from this. 2023 might have just completely f***ed us, because not only did we get three utterly abysmal sequels to horror franchises, but they all made an absolute sh** pile of money. Insidious 5 made almost $200 million on a budget of 16. The Nun 2 made over $250 million on a budget of 38. And The Exorcist Believer, by far the most soulless and artistically abusive of the bunch, made almost five times its budget, and a pair of sequels are already in the works. This is a film that did not even succeed in scaring my wife, who I often succeed in scaring when I just walk into a room, normally. It also resurrects a masterpiece after 50 years, only to bring absolutely nothing new or original to the table, brings back an iconic character only to make her utterly useless and then butcher her, and finally blames all the horrific events of the first film on, wait for it, the patriarchy. It honestly feels as though this movie was created in a laboratory specifically to piss me off. To piss off self-respecting horror fans everywhere, actually. I truly believe that everyone involved in the making of this movie should be blacklisted like a McCarthy-era communist. And finally, we come to the coup de gras of this disastrous year in horror, with a film that, when given the evergreen storytelling advice to show, don't tell, 
opted to do neither. My top spot on this list could only go to Skinnamarink, an experimental horror movie that is really only a movie in the same way that a hot dog is a sandwich, and that it's not. This is honestly nothing more than just a collection of fuzzy b-roll. You're in a house, and the camera is rolling, and it's dark, and it's like, here's, here's a coffee table for a few minutes. And here's a wall, and here's the carpet. This is another one of those movies technically listed as a 2022 release, but almost everyone who saw it did so in 2023. And in film circles, this was getting just an absurd amount of buzz. People saying this is the scariest movie they've ever seen. If there's someone in your life who has recommended this movie to you, I regret to inform you that you can never trust them about anything again. Like if your spouse recommends this movie to you, they probably have a second family. I think the most likely explanation for Skinnamarink's existence is that it's just a massive social experiment to see if there's any limit to what film nerds will pretend to enjoy in their quest to appear artistically discerning. I said this in my original video Video, but it bears repeating here. This is a 100 minute movie that could be three minutes with absolutely nothing of import removed. This is a film year where, you know, I said that the last voyage of the Demeter was devoid of enjoyment. Skinnamarink, by contrast, is a film that's devoid of some of the more essential aspects of movie making. It's, it's devoid of, of characters, a plot, a camera that wasn't purchased at the Dollar Tree. The Exorcist Believer is more infuriating, more of an affront to the genre, but I promise you this, if you choose to watch Skinnamarink, you will never have your time more brazenly wasted in your entire life. All right, guys, thus ends the 2023rd year of our Lord. Thank you for watching this video, quite possibly the only video ever made that contains references to both Tolstoy and the inestimable Scott teams. Here's hoping that 2024 gives us more horror movies that actually live up to their potential, and here's hoping you survive to watch me talk about them.